Glory to God. Woo, Doc. Calling He's calling them in. Amen. You know, every time I hear that, and I know I say it probably every service, but I, I really truly believe that one day people are going to hear that trumpet blow, and it ain't going to be that far off. And, and I'll tell you, the people from our church, I hope they don't think, well, that's Doc blowing his horn. No. It's Gabriel blowing his. Amen? Yeah, for all of us to come home. Yes, amen. Let's open this up with prayer. So pray with me. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come tonight, and God, as we enter into this service, God, we just fully submit ourselves to you, Father. Father, we ask that you take over, that you lead us, you direct us, you guide us, God. God, it's not our will, but your will be done tonight, God. God, just lead us in that direction, God, that you, on that path, God, that you've set before us. Father, let us be a light into this old dark world, God. God, let people look upon us and say, you know what? They've, they've been in the presence of Jesus. And God, let them want that, crave that, God. God, that living water that flows from us, God. God, just make them thirsty for you. Father, we'll just praise you tonight. Father, we'll give you the glory tonight. And we'll do it all in Jesus' name. And everybody will say, Amen. 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 I truly believe that God is calling us, His people, not just to, to, to be ready for Him, but to, to, to reach out to others, to tell them, to give them that last chance, that last opportunity to, to, to turn over a new leaf, to, to open themselves up to God. Because I'm telling you, time is getting short. I don't care what people say. No, I can't put a specific time or a date or anything on it. But I just know. I just know that I know. And I, and I have no, no anything to just sit and say, well, this is it, this and this and this. No, I just feel it in my... But God, Jesus said, you'll know the times. You'll see around you. There'll be rumors of wars and rumors of wars. The... I read a deal today where they said that, I forget, Christianity, churches have, have diminished by 12%. 12%. And I thought, man, that's a big percentage when you stop to thinking about, when you put that in millions, that's thousands of people have walked away. They said that it, since January that three to 5,000 pastors have resigned, have quit. Listen, it's, it's getting serious. It's getting serious, and it's time for us to get serious with him. But the good news is, is God ain't just calling the preachers to get out and tell them. He's calling each and every one of his children. He, you know what? You're qualified. When you receive the Holy Ghost and you worry about, well, what am I going to say? What am I going to witness? Don't the Bible tell you that the Holy Ghost will, will give you utterance? He knows exactly what we're to say, what we're to do. And I heard somebody say, well, somebody told me the other day, said, uh, I, I ain't sure I'm a Christian. Well, why not? Why not? Why ain't you sure? You know, the devil's going around like a, a lion seeking whom he may. It didn't say that he can. It said that he, who he may devour. That means you have to give him okay. To devour you. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The, the devil can't do anything that we, we don't allow him to do in us. We have the power. We have the authority. But we just give in to those things. And we allow the devil to lie to us. And, and I'm telling you, he's, he's doing a lot of lying lately. And, and the more lies that he can... Spread with you. And he'll put just enough truth to it to make you believe it. That's his, that's his secret weapon. And he'll put fear on you. Fear, boy. Fear will make you do things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. Out of fear. Listen. If God be for you, who can be against you? So what have we got to fear? If we've received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if we truly did that, 
then we, we don't have to worry or fear about anything because God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or we even think. That's what the Bible tells us. If you believe the Bible, then you know what? Fear has no place in your life. Because God said, I'd be there for you 24-7. He said, if you'll call, I'll answer. He said, nothing's impossible for him. Jesus even went a step further and said, if you can believe, nothing's impossible for you. Amen. So why don't, we, why don't we open up to him and say, you know what, Lord? Whatever comes, <laughs> as long as you're with me, I can, I can handle it. Because I know you'll bring me through it. You know, God didn't promise smooth sailing through this life. He didn't. Matter of fact, he even gave us warnings. He said, when you call in the midst of trouble, I'll get you through. I'll get you out of it. So he, he, he knew there'd be troubles in our life. He knew there'd be storms here and there. But, you know, those things are what makes us stronger in our faith. When these things come upon us, then, then we, can, we, we, we call on him and, and see things work out. Not, not presently, but hindsight's twenty twenty. You can look back and say, well, you know what? If God hadn't got me through that, I could have never made it myself. Amen. And think about the alternative of giving up. That means defeat. That's giving in to whatever it is that you're giving up to. Amen. That's just not an option for a Christian. And I'm telling you that without the resistance our faith would never get stronger. It's resistance that makes us stronger in him. And the devil is, is trying his best to persuade people that, hey, you don't need to go to church. Look at these empty seats. He's winning. He is. People are listening to that trash. You don't, God don't hear your prayers. People are, I hear it all the time, God. God don't answer my prayers. That's not the truth. Maybe it ain't the way that you envisioned it. Because we have a, an imagination about how it ought to come to pass. And if it didn't come to pass like that, well, God didn't answer my prayer. No, God has a better way. And maybe it ain't the right time. Because God sees down the road. And if we want it now, down the road, we would have been a mess. Listen, we've got to come to a point of, of, of faith in him, believing. I put, I put this up here for a specific reason, to believe. Believe, that's the, I've got to believe over there. I want to put believe everywhere I could put it because I want people to believe. And if you believe, then these things won't get you down because you believe that God is who he says he is. And that is a rewarder of them that diligently, what? Believe. Amen. Come on now. Let's be real with God. God's real with us. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to hush up because I know Doc's got a good, good message for us tonight. Listen, I appreciate these teachings. Amen. I have learned so much through these teachings. And people say, well, you're a preacher. You ought to know. But you just don't know it all. You have to hear it. Amen. And where does faith come from? hearing. Amen. So there you go. Sister, you ready to sing a song? Don't her hair look good? I think I like that.
Well, Brother Jim said he had a song, so come on up, Jim. You know how God puts you in places where he wants you to be? <laughs> Monday, Mary and I went to get her meds, and when we was leaving there, I said, do we need to stop at Brahms and get anything before we go home? And she said, no, there ain't nothing I can think of. And I said, well, I can get me some ice cream. I'm out of ice cream. And so she said, well, yeah. So I pulled in Brahms. And I got out of the truck, and when I got out of the truck, I looked down, and there's a debit card laying in the parking lot. <laughs> and I reached down and picked it up, looked at the man's name, and opened the door on the truck and told Mary, he said, I'm going to go in Brahms and see if that guy's still in there. <laughs> so I went in Brahms, and I went to every man in there, was asking him if he was that man, and they all said, no, no. No. And this woman stood up and said, hey. And I said, what? And she said, he's here you're looking for. And he said, what do you want him for? And I said, well, I found his debit card in the parking lot. And he got up and he walked over to me and he said, what? And I said, I found your debit card in the parking lot. And he said, wow. And I said, said well. And so he pulled his billfold out and showed me and said, said, it's me. And I said, well, you don't have to tell me it's you. Said, she said it was you. And, and they said, well, I just want you to know that, that I'm giving, you're giving the card to the right one. And I said, well, said, and he said, I just got that card. And I said, he said, I must have, when I put my keys in the pocket, I must have pulled the card out. And he gave me a hug and told me, he said, I'm sure glad you found it. And then he said, God bless you. <laughs> so, so God used me, you know, thinking about stopping at Brahms, and God used me to find that man's card. <laughs> and so I praise God for what, what he does. <laughs> Sonny, you'll like this one. <laughs> Abraham and Sarah never thought they'd have a son. Then sinners came as countless as the stars. Moses and God's people had nowhere left to run. Then the waters of the Red Sea stood apart. So many times the light of hope was setting like the sun. And it seemed to the faithful it was over, it was done. But God <laughs> sees some ways. When miracles are well beyond our view, His love saves the day when fear would tell us there is no use. You can look the whole world over for the meaning of it all, for the purpose that mankind has always sought. In the end you'll discover there is no answer but God. I know your heart is breaking, the pain just comes in waves. Everywhere you look, it seems like there's no peace. You try not to give up, but the tears will not relent. Any minute now, you might accept defeat. And you stand there with impossible, the next words on your lips. And your vision has been blinded and nothing makes sense. But God sees some way when miracles are well beyond our view. That his love saves the day when fear would tell us there is no snow use. You can look the world, world over for the meaning of it all, for the purpose that mankind has always sought. In the end, you'll discover there's no other answer. But God, in the end, you'll discover there is no other answer. But God, no other answer. But God. You're right, I like that, but God. Hallelujah.
Yes, sir, brother. Harvey. Well, here we are. They said it's supposed to be a bad storm today. So far, I don't hear anything outside. It looked like it was raining at the house when I just looked at the camera. But that's all right. We can use the rain, amen? amen. I was thinking about that today. You know, what happens if it ever rained? It'd be a horrible mess we'd be in, wouldn't it? We'd be trying to find water everywhere. But thank God he's good. He sends that rain on the just and the unjust both. So just because it's raining doesn't mean you're right with God. Amen? I don't know why I said that, but maybe it means something. You know, but it's true. Uh, I am looking forward to what God is doing. I know we are going through some difficult times in this world. And the, the Maldons just flew to India on Monday. And we need to remember them in prayer. They're in a non-Christian nation. Uh, a nation that does persecute Christians, not uh, not as far as I know from a legal standpoint, but from a cultural standpoint, and in fact, even from uh, uh, there are times when Hindus and Muslims both will attack Christians, um, kill the pastors. There was the thing earlier this year was killing the pastors and burning the churches. Well, that doesn't stop us. Amen. And uh, we pray for those pastors' families and ask God to, uh, to raise that men and women of God. Amen. And so we need to keep them in prayer while they're there and pray that they have a very successful trip in sharing the gospel and come alongside churches. Uh, missionaries used to go out in the field themselves and teach and preach, and that was good. And then it got better when we went out and taught those indigenous people in other words if you're in america you're american and if you're in india you're you're indian uh but teach indians and that to spread the gospel themselves and that's much more successful and that's what the uh the Maldives do they come alongside churches and pastors and help uh pastors uh become pastors and uh churches become churches and a uh, witness to the hindu uh neighbors that they have and I uh, certainly believe in their ministry. Uh, I'm praying um, to be able to raise enough money for another water well before the year's out. Got a couple months to do that. And uh, um, let's just put it this way. It doesn't matter if the creek wise, but if the Lord's willing, that certainly will happen. Amen. And I believe in supporting ministries like that. And I think it's one of the most valuable uh, things we can do. In India and even around the world whatever we can do to help others find Jesus amen? amen so we may be a small church but we've got a big God amen, amen. and uh, I want to sing this song I know with uh, favor to some people's because um, uh, we struggle don't we amen. we sometimes take one step forward and two steps back. One step forward, two steps back. Oh, Lord, I'm losing ground. I can't win in my own strength. I feel my feet are bound. One step forward, two steps back. Lord, tell me what it takes 
to win this battle for my life, for this poor soul's sake. The spirit isn't willing, my flesh, it's weak. Here on my knees, it's you I see. I realize now what I don't have is a close walk with you. I've strayed so far, Lord, bring me back to where my love was new. I realize now you never change. The change was me alone. How far I've gone from you, oh Lord, I'm coming home. Coming home. I'm coming home. One step forward, one step back. Oh Lord, I'm standing ground. I can't win in my own strength, but in you, strength abounds. One step forward, one step back. Lord, show me what it takes. To win this battle for my life, to win for heaven's sake. Two steps forward, not one back. I'm finally gaining ground. No, I can't win in my own strength, but in you, my strength abounds. Two steps forward, not one back. Help me do what it takes. To win this battle for their souls, to win for Jesus' sake. Dr. James Rankin, are you ready? Praise God. I feel like this church is so blessed to have a man like Doc. He does these papers for us, and he does the study, and he checks it all out. And I'm going to tell you what, these, these studies makes us a better Christian. It, it helps our faith to grow. Okay, we got a good lesson tonight, I think. Uh, everybody get their geography hat out and put it on. Uh -oh. And their history hat and put it on. I'm going to do a little bit of that, too. Oh, I better grab my glasses. So. Pastor, you want to go ahead and read our verses? Oh, okay. Am I on? No, I'm on. 
After six days, Jesus taketh Peter and James and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto I'm him, unto them, Moses and Elias, talking with him. Then answered Peter, and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us this to be here. here. If thou wilt That's let us make make here three tabernacles. One for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. <clears throat> While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and w were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatso whatsoever they listed. I li likewise shall also the man of the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Thank you, Pastor. <clears throat> now here, this is the preview of the second coming. Uh, it's what we call the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. And... Uh, I didn't really understand all of it until uh, I got into the lesson here. And there's just so much information. There's just so much to be gleaned out of this. And, of course, we're never, you could never humanly exhaust everything that could come out of these verses and, and the way that God can use it there. As noted at the end of the previous lesson, the preview of Jesus' glory that he promised some of the disciples would experience before they died, doubtlessly referred to his transfiguration, the event related in the present text. Six days, it says, after the promise was given, it was fulfilled. Now, numbers are important in the Bible. Now, I'm not a numerologist and I'm not any type of an expert on uh, the the numbers of the, of the Bible but I don't and I don't profess to but think about six days where else in the Bible do you see six days God created the heaven and the earth in six days okay what else? Six is, six is the number of man. Okay. What did uh, What did God tell Adam and Eve in the garden concerning Christ? Christ he said the devil was going to do what to Christ going to bruise his heel but Christ was going to crush the devil okay 
So here we go. Six days. We are right now at the end, the very, 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 very end of the sixth day. And we're, gonna, we're talking about 6,000 years from the time of the Garden of Eden until now. What happens on the seventh day? God did what? He rested. Jesus Christ is going to come on the seventh day. Amen. And he will reign for a thousand years on this earth. And we will reign with him. Amen. And what happens on the eighth day? A new heaven, a new earth, a new week starts, and time is no more. Amen. So, six days after the promise was given, it was fulfilled. The fact that Luke said it was some eight days later simply indicates that he was speaking in inclusive terms, unlike Matthew and Mark. Whereas those writers referred to the six intervening days between the prediction and the fulfillment, Luke also included the days in which those events occurred. Peter, James, and John, his brother, were the most in, in, intimate disciples of Jesus, constituting with Peter's brother, Andrew, the Lord's inner circle. It is therefore not surprising that it was these three men whom he led up, led them up a high mountain themselves. Now, we don't know what mountain this is. Tradition says that Jesus was transfigured on Mount Tabor. However, Harvey, could you pull up Israel 1? And if everybody will turn around, I can get up to this screen right here. Well, here comes a little geography. Jesus is already at Caesarea Philippi. That's where he's been talking. Okay? This is Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is not that far away from Caesarea Philippi. Mount Tabor is way down here. Okay? Okay? So it's very possible that Mount Hermon is the mountain on which Jesus took the disciples here. Now, Mount Hermon is in the Bible in several places. It is the northern, northeastern border of the original nation of Israel. And this, the half-tribe of, ha of Manasseh had this area right here. And so... Harvey, would you go to slide two? Okay. Here's Israel right here. Lebanon, Syria, Jordan's down here. Israel lost Mount Hermon. Okay. Even when Israel became a nation in 1948, they didn't have Mount Hermon. It was not until the Six-Day War in 1967 that Israel took this area from Syria. Now, this area, everybody has been in the news. You know what the Golan Heights are. They're always talking about the Golan Heights and the West Bank. You hear those two terms all the time. So... Israel has occupied the Golan Heights, including Mount Hermon. So that has been returned to Israel. These two countries, Israel and Syria, they are still at war. But the UN has put a buffer zone right here between these two, right here. And so it keeps the two army or the two sides from fighting. But Israel has never returned the Golan Heights. And we know that that is part of the original 
nation of Israel. God promised it. God give it to them. God's not a man that he should lie. The promise is forever. Amen. So, okay, slide three. All righty. In the 1967 war, Israel took the West Bank. Well, Jerusalem was in the West Bank. And so the Israelis now have control of Jerusalem. Amen. Okay? The Golan Heights are right up here. You can see Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan. They also took the Sinai Peninsula. Now, the Sinai is where they wandered around for 40 years Amen. in the desert. Okay, this little strip right here is now in the news, the Gaza Strip. Yes. Israel has that. Now, in the peace agreement between, was it Anwar Sadat and Menach Menach Menachem Begin, is that his name? They agreed to peace. So Israel and, and Egypt are at peace, and Israel returned the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt. But they kept the Gaza Strip, they kept the West Bank, and they're keeping the Golan Heights. Now, that's where we're at. Okay. Mount Hermon is the highest mountain in Israel. It is the headwaters of the Jordan River. Uh, let's see. Okay, that's pretty much it. All right. That's your first history. Okay. <laughs> Four reasons seem to suggest themselves for Jesus taking only these three with him to witness his transfiguration. Think about it. He only took three disciples. How many did he have? Twelve. Twelve. So he left nine of them back. Why do you suppose he did that? Maybe. Wouldn't it hurt your feelings if you... You know, it'd probably hurt my feelings. If, you know, if I wasn't one of the three, if I knew. But... Anyway... First, they would be reliable witnesses of his manifested glory, able to confirm the event to the other disciples and to the rest of the church. According to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 19, on the evidence of two or three witnesses shall a charge be established. The Lord promised display of his kingdom glory and would be confirmed by the testimony of these three trustworthy witnesses. Second, these three men were probably chosen because of their intimacy with Jesus. They were with him the most and understood him the best, and they frequently accompanied him when he went away for times of intense fellowship with his heavenly Father. It was fitting that those who would mo be most intimate share his suffering and sorrow would also most intimately share witnessing his glory. Third, as the acknowledged spokesman among the twelve, the ones whose word was most respected, these three men could most reliably and convincingly articulate what they witnessed on the mountain. The fourth possible reason is negative. If all twelve disciples had, been, had seen the transfiguration, or if all of the twelve plus the crowds that had been with them in Upper Galilee were to have seen Jesus transfigured, the entire region could quickly have been in turmoil. The people may have run down the hillside and into the surrounding towns, babbling uncontrollably about what they had just seen. The accounts doubtlessly would have varied greatly and been embellished with each retelling, and Jesus could have, had, could have been pressured even more forcibly to become the political and military deliverer the people expected the Messiah to be. This particular high mountain is not identified, but it was apparently somewhere near to the south of Caesarea Philippi on the route to Capernaum and eventually Jerusalem. We learn from Luke 9, as in the garden, these three disciples could not stay awake despite the momentousness of the experience. It was from sorrow that they slept in the garden, and it was perhaps for the same reason that they slept on the mountaintop. 
Sleep can be a form of escape, a way of temporarily forgetting problems and anxieties. Depression accelerates weariness. It is likely that the promise Jesus made a few days earlier was too vague and indefinite to bolster their spirits after learning of his impending suffering and death and his call for them to be willing to suffer and die in his service. They slept the sleep of frustration and depression. It was not until Moses and Elijah appeared that the three became fully awake and they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. In the events that followed are found five powerful confirmations or proofs that Jesus was indeed the predicted son of man, the Messiah, the divine king of glory. First is the transformation of the son. The second is the testimony of the saints. The third is the terror of the father. The fourth is what may be called the tapestry of the scene. And the fifth is the tie with Jesus' forerunner, John the Baptist. The first three are given during the transfiguration, and the last two are just afterwards. <laughs> the transformation of the sun, and he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. The word transfigured is from metamorpho, which has the basic meaning of changing in another form, and is the term from which we get the word metamorphosis. Everybody that's had any science class in grade school or junior high or high school knows the word metamorphosis. Because no further description is given, all we know of the change is that during this brief display of divine glory, Jesus' face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. The Jesus who had been living for over 30 years in ordinary human form was now particularly or was now partially seen in the blazing effulgence of God from within himself in a way that defies full description and much less full explanation. Jesus' divine glory was manifested before Peter, James, and John. So anybody got any ideas what that might lo have looked like? Would it be like seeing a ghost? Okay. So this human man all of a sudden now is radiating white, bright light. And he's talking with two dudes. Now, that's all the description we got. But we know it was something so dramatic that it it made an impression upon the disciples. Yeah, amen. Here's the greatest confirmation of his deity yet in the life of Jesus. Here, more than on any other occasion, Jesus revealed himself as he truly is, the Son of God. As the divine glory radiated from his face, it illuminated even his clothes, which became white as light. In supernatural testimony to his splen spiritual splendor, as with the Shekinah manifestations of the Old Testament, God here portrayed himself to human eyes in a form of light so dazzling and overwhelming that it could barely be withstood. Now, does the Bible not say we're going to see Jesus as he is? Amen. Okay, this is what these three men saw. Yeah. They saw Jesus as he really is. The light portrayed Jesus' glory and majesty, as Peter testified years later in the, his second epistle. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The experience of seeing Christ's glory must have been a major contributor to the second comings, becoming a dominant theme of Peter's preaching and writing. The message of his two epistles might be summarized. Fellow believers, don't worry about your pain, your hardship, your testing, your persecution, your sacrifice. Jesus is coming. Amen. That's all that really matters. John later testified, 
We have seen his glory, glory as of the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We have no record of James' testimony to this event. Remember, James was martyred in the very early days of the church, the first apostle to give his life for Christ. As best they could with human eyes, these men had seen the essence of God shine forth from Jesus. Now, it couldn't be God the Father. You can't look upon God the Father. Remember, he told Moses, I'm going to pass by. and You can see my hinder parts, but not, not face on. That awesome experience was but a foretaste of the day in which the Son of Man is going to come with his angels. On that day, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. When Jesus Christ comes back the second time, there will be no mistaking that he is God. Everybody in the world will see him. And everybody in the world will know that he is God. And many of them will mourn. Why do you think they're going to mourn? They messed up. It's too late. They didn't receive him. And they're going to realize uh, there is a God. And I'm in trouble. In his vision on Patmos, John saw the returning Christ as one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his human form, Jesus Christ was veiled. But when he comes again to earth, he will come in his full, divine, majestic glory. And the glimpse of which Peter, James, and John witnessed on the mountain. There could henceforth be no doubt in their minds that he was God incarnate. And there should have been no doubt that he would some come someday in the fullness of his glory. Amen. The testimony of the saints. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, what in the world is, is he talking about, making a tent? Not a temple, a tent. Where, where did he come up with that? We're going to find out. Now, I don't know. Tom, I got a question. How did these men know it was Moses and Elijah? I mean, how did they know it was Moses and Elijah? It had to be. Right. They've never seen Moses or Elijah. So it had to be something that was so convincing that, hey, that's Moses and that's Elijah. Now, maybe the men said, hey, I'm Moses, and the other one said, hey, I'm Elijah. We don't know. We don't know, but uh, I, I've seen pictures of this event, and Moses is holding the, the tablet, the Ten Commandments. You know, it's man's projection of, of, you know, well, that's how you know it's Moses, yeah. and, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, that, I know that's, but, that's not really real. That's just what men have come up with. But there had to be something so dramatic that, that these three disciples knew that this was Moses and Elijah. And as the three disciples watched in amazement, Moses and Elijah also appeared to them, shrouded in the Lord's glory. The testimony of those two Old Testament saints was a second confirmation of his deity. Why, we may wonder, were these two men chosen out of the many godly Old Testament believers 
he might have been chosen. Why those two? Anybody? Why not Abraham? He's the pretty important dude in the Bible, right? Yeah. What about David? Of all the people in the Bible, David's, he's right up there. Or what about Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Isaiah? Why not them? Okay. Anybody else got any idea? Tom? Okay. Okay. They probably more than the others represented the Old Testament. Uh, let's see. Why, for instance, did God not present Abraham, the father of the Hebrew people, and of all the faithful? Why was David not selected, the one who, from whose throne Jesus would one day reign? Why was A Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, or one of the other prophets not chosen? Scripture gives no explanation, but it seems more, it seems that more than the others, Moses and Elijah typified the Old Testament man of God. Moses was synonymous with the old covenant, covenant which the Lord gave through him. The Jewish scriptures were often referred to as Moses and the prophets. And the Old Testament law was more often called the law of Moses. Reared in the court of Pharaoh, exiled to the fields and flocks of Midian to learn humility and become a servant of God, and then chosen by the Lord to lead his people out of bondage and to give them his law and lead them to the borders of the promised land. Moses was supremely God's man. Besides the Lord himself, he was arguably the greatest leader in human history. He led an estimated two million rebellious, faithless people out of Egypt into the wilderness, where they wandered together for 40 years, while God raised up a more obedient and manageable generation. Before the people of Israel had formal prophets, Moses was a kind of a prophet, bringing them God's word. Before they had formal priests, he was a kind of a priest, me mediating between them and God. Remember? People said, look, the mountain was shaking and quaking, and they said, uh-uh, Moses, you go on up there. We're going to stay here. We're going to let you go up there. And before they had formal kings, he was a kind of a king ruling them in God's name. Perhaps the only other Old Testament man who could have stood with Moses was Elijah. Moses was the great lawgiver. Elijah was the great defender of the law. The prophet was zeal personified, a godly man of unmatched courage, boldness, and fearlessness. He had a heart of God. He walked with God. And more than any other Old Testament saint, he was the instrument of God's miracle-working power. He was the preeminent prophet of God, and to the Jews, the most romantic Old Testament personality. As no others, Moses and Elijah represented the Old Testament, the law, and the prophets. And as no other, they could give human testimony to Christ's divine maj majesty and glory. By their presence together, they affirmed, in effect, this is the one of whom we testified, the one in whose power we ministered, and then the one whom everything we said and did has meaning. Everything we spoke, accomplished, and hoped for is fulfilled in him. From Luke, we learn that these two great saints were talking with Jesus of his departure, and which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. They were not simply standing there passively reflecting on the Lord's glory, but they were talking with him as friend to friend about his departure, his imminent sacrifice, which was the supreme objective and work of his early ministry. Now, Peter, James, and John, they're hearing all this conversation. Departure is from the Greek term we get exodus, just as the exodus out of Egypt under Moses led God's people out of the bondage of slavery, the exodus of Jesus out of the grave would lead believers out of the bondage of sin. This would be accomplished, as Luke reports, at Jerusalem. It was significant that the discussion was about Christ's saving work through his death. 
because that was the central work of his ministry. Yet it is the truth the disciples found most difficult to accept. Moses and Elijah not only gave confirmation of Jesus' divine glory, but of his divine plan. Their supernatural testimony, no doubt later gave the apostles added conviction and courage as they proclaimed that Jesus was delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Jesus is the predicted Savior and King, they affirm before these three apostles, and his divine plan is on schedule. Jesus' death and resurrection were an inseparable part of his plan, without which redemption from sin would have been impossible. He was infinitely more than a good man whose example shows other men the way of God. He himself was God, and it was by his atoning sacrifice as a substitute for men that he himself brings those who trust him to God. No man can come to God by following Jesus' example because no man could offer a sufficient sacrifice even for his own sins, much less for the sins of the whole world. It was therefore imperative for the disciples to understand that Jesus' coming the first time to die and rise again was as much a part of the divine plan as his coming again in glory. As Moses and Elijah were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Luke gives additional information that Peter spoke, not really not realizing what he was saying. You ever, you ever done that? Something just runs out of your mouth? Yeah, and you look, see the look on somebody else's face and you think, oh, I should not have said that. Peter completely failed to comprehend the significance of Jesus' glory or of Moses and Elijah's testimony. Seemingly oblivious to the affirmation that Jesus must go to Jerusalem and die and that the glory they now witness was but a preview of the full glory in which he would in the future come again. In his combined bewilderment and fear, Peter could think of nothing but making three tents or tabernacles with his own hands in which Jesus and the two Old Testament witnesses could dwell. We can only guess at Peter's motive for making the suggestion except that he obviously was content to remain with the Lord on the mountaintop. Ooh, I like that idea, you know. Don't we like it when we're on the mountain and the mountain's not on us? And we're on the mountain and we're there with God and we're going hand in hand and we want to stay right there. But that's not God's way. We've got to come down off that mountain and we've got to walk through the valley. Seemingly oblivious, to, oh, uh, let's see, I said that, okay. Uh, he had no interest in Jesus going to Jerusalem or his coming again. He wanted the Lord to stay, not leave and return. He especially did not want him to have to leave by the way of death. As usual, he was caught up with his own plans and will rather than the Lord's. Although he prefaced the suggestion, if you wish, Peter assumed Jesus would approve. New Testament chronologists have determined that the Jewish month in which the transfiguration took place was Tishri. Guess what? That's in October of our calendar. The sixth month before the Passover, therefore six months before Jesus was crucified. During this month, the Jews, they did what? They celebrated a feast. The Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And guess what they did? They went outside and they made tents or tabernacles. Amen. Now maybe you can start to see what old Peter might have been thinking. Yeah. Because as it would be, it could be very well be possible that as Jesus was transfigured, this feast was going on. During this month, the Jews celebrated the Feast of Tabernacle or Booths, and it is possible that at this very time, the feast was observed 
in Jerusalem. During a period of seven days, the people lived in small shelters or booths made of bows, symbolizing temporary dwellings of their forefathers in the wilderness. It was a memorial to God's preserving his chosen and redeemed people. Zechariah predicted that the, during the millennium, when the Lord will be king over all the earth, on that day the Lord will be one and his name one, then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of booths. Now this is the only feast that God given, give the nation of Israel that will be observed during the millennial reign of Christ. The Feast of Tabernacles occurs in the Jewish month of Tishri. Starts on the 15th of the month. This year, it occurred between September 30th and October 7th. Israel was attacked on the morning of October 7th. The festival is for a period of harvest or the ingathering. What does that tell you, saints? Christ is gathering. He's harvesting. It lasts seven days and then on the 22nd day of the month there is another holiday and it's called the 8th day assembly so all of those on the 8th day which are going to be with Christ in heaven and a new heaven and a new earth are being gathered God's smart man he's smart Okay. Uh, can you read John 7, 37, and 38? That's right after 6 and just before 8. <laughs> John 7, 37, 38. <laughs> yeah. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he, and he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath say, said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This is the last day yep. of the Feast of Tabernacles. Of the last day Jesus of the Christ stands up yep. and says, if anyone will come to me, and I'm paraphrasing, if anyone will come to me, he will never thirst. He will never hunger again. Amen. Amen. <coughs> that, see, that is the only week-long Old Testament festival that will be celebrated during the millennial reign of Christ. The Feast of the Tabernacles will re be remembered every year for a thousand years as a picture of God's deliverance and preservation of his people. The feast being close at hand may therefore have caused Peter to suggest building three tents on the mountain. That possibly is even more likely in the light that the fact that this festival commemorated the exodus from slavery in Egypt and the wilderness wanderings of Israel under Moses. As noted above, Moses and Elijah were talking with Jesus about his departure or exodus, the soon coming and infinitely greater deliverance of believing mankind from sin. How appropriate then, Peter may have thought, to celebrate the feast in that sacred place, not only with the presence of Moses himself, 
but in the presence of the even greater deliverer whom Moses foreshadowed and of whom Elijah was to be the forerunner. Peter's idea was not so much wrong as foolish. He was foolish in perhaps thinking that Jesus might not have to die after all and that there was now opportunity to fulfill his mis mission by avoiding the cross and therefore avo avoiding the need of later returning. Peter was also foolish in placing Moses and Elijah, great as they were, on the same level as Christ by wanting to build tents for all three of them. As previously noted, when Peter made his suggestion, Moses and Elijah were already departing. They knew their mission was temporary and their testimony to Christ was now completed. In their ministries, they had merely proclaimed the word of the law and the prophets. But Jesus Christ, the living word, was both the giver and the perfect fulfillment of the law and the prophets, whose purpose was to point men to himself. Leaving Christ in unchallenged supremacy, Moses and Elijah faded away so that the sole remaining object of adoration was the glorious Lord himself. Once their testimony to him was finished, they could not stay and risk distracting from him. The terror of the Father. Is God scary? God scary? Does he, does he cause terror in you? He doesn't? Okay, we're supposed to fear him. And that's a, a reverential fear. And if we do that, we don't have any terror. But if we're not doing that, we should have terror. We should. His voice was still speaking, or he was still speaking, when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. A third confirmation of Jesus' deity was the terror caused by the intervention of the Father while Peter was still speaking. Through the form of a bright cloud, God overshadowed the three disciples and spoke to them in a voice from the cloud. To the testimony of the transfiguration itself and the testimony of two Old Testament saints was now added the surprising testimony of God the Father. Throughout the wilderness wanderings of Israel, the Lord himself manifested through a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on their way. Isaiah predicted that when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by a spirit of judgment and by a spirit of burning, then the Lord will create over the whole site of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day and a smoke and the shining of flame of fire by night. For over all the glory will be a canopy. In his vision of the last days, John looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud one like the Son of Man, with a golden crown on his hand and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. And so he who sat on the cloud, swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Out of such a bright cloud, the Father overshadowed Peter, James, and John, and spoke to them in an audible voice, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now, I've often asked God, especially when I'm down in the mother grubs and feel like the mountain's on top of me, and... I'm exhausted, and I prayed and prayed and prayed, and the God just, like he's got his ears stopped up, and he's not listening, and he's not doing anything. And uh, God, just come and speak to me. Speak to me. Just come come and speak to me in a, in a human voice. Just tell me it's going to be okay. 
I don't know what I would do if that happened. I might be terrified too. The Father spoke almost identical words at Jesus' baptism and during Jesus' last week in Jerusalem, but a few days before his betrayal and arrest and crucifixion. The Father again publicly and directly declared his approval of his Son. In calling Jesus his Son, the Father declared him to be of identical nature and essence with himself. Scripture frequently refers to believers as children of God, but they are adopted children brought into the heavenly family only through the miracle of his grace. Jesus is the essence of divine nature, as the apostles repeatedly emphasized. In calling Jesus his beloved son, the Father declared not only a relationship of divine nature, but a relationship of divine love, that they had a relationship of mutual love, commitment, and identification in every way. In saying, with whom I am well pleased, the Father declared his approval with everything the Son was, said, and did. Everything about Jesus was in perfect accord with the Father's will and plan. Then directly addressing the three disciples, perhaps Peter in particular, God said, listen to him. He, said, he was saying, in effect, if my son tells you he must go to Jerusalem to suffer and die, believe him. If he tells you he will be raised up on the third day, believe him. If he tells you to take up your own cross and follow him, then that's what you're to do. If he says he will come again in glory, then believe him and live your life accordingly. The outspoken brash Peter and his two companions now knew they stood in the awesome presence of Almighty God. As would be expected when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. Peter was, so, was probably so utterly traumatized that he promptly forgot about his presumptuous suggestion to build three tents. The combined awareness of the Lord's grace and his majesty, his love and his justice, his friendship and his lordship, should cause a kind of spiritual tension in every believer. On the one hand, he rejoices in his loving fellowship with the Lord because of his gracious kindness. And on the other hand, he has reverential fear as he contemplates his awesome holiness and righteousness. As the believer walks in obedience to God, he experiences the comfort of his presence. But as he walks in disobedience, he should feel the terror of that same presence. Amen. Proverbs declares that spiritual wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. Amen. Sinful men in the presence of a holy God always want to hide. Before the fall, Adam and Eve had uninterrupted fellowship with God. But after they seen, sinned, that relationship was vastly changed. And when they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. When Isaiah beheld the divine majesty and glory that surrounded the heavenly throne, he cried out in great fear, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. As he stood in the presence of perfect holiness, the sense of his own utter sinfulness overwhelmed him. Daniel was likewise terrified when the Lord spoke directly to him after his vision of the ram, goat, and the little horn. The tapestry of the scene but Jesus came and touched them saying rise and have no fear and when they lifted their eyes they saw no one but Jesus only and as they were coming down the mountain Jesus commanded them tell no one of the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead the fourth confirmation of Jesus Jesus's deity was the entire tapestry of the scene that gave testimony to Christ's majestic power and royal splendor. It was less specific and dramatic than the first three, but in its own way was impressive. Now tapestries are like embroidered or sewn and they're hung on walls and they took the place of pictures, but they, they told a story. Jesus was still the center of the scene, just as he will be at his second coming. He was standing on a high mountain, 
much as when he returns to earth when his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. When he comes, he will come with his saints. Who? That's you and us. That's, we're coming back with him. Okay? We're, as Tom had said, we're going to have jobs. We're, we're going to have jobs. Just as here, he accompanied, is accompanied by Moses and Elijah, saints of the Old Covenant. And when he comes, he will also come to his saints. So who is he coming to? Those who are alive and remain. Specifically, there will be 144,000 of the tribe of Israel that will go through the tribulation, protected, alive, and they will come out alive. And, as far as I understand, there will be other people that have come through the tribulation alive. Alive, and they have not taken the mark of the beast. Let's see. Another interesting aspect of the scene is the fact that whereas Moses died, Elijah did not, having been carried up to heaven by a whirlwind. Moses, therefore, represented the saints who will have died by the time Jesus returns and the saints who will have been raptured. Symbolically, the mountain is there. The people with whom he comes are there. The people to whom he comes are there. And both the saints who have died and the saints who have been translated are there. Jesus' first actions and words after his mighty display of splendor were those of a gentle, loving care. Knowing the great fear of his three beloved companions, Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. As they hesitantly lifted up their eyes, it must have been a great relief to see no one but Jesus only. The impressions of the experience were now indebitably inscribed in their minds they could testify with certain boldness that jesus had indeed manifested himself in glory before some of them had tasted death some 30 years later peter would write for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our lord jesus christ but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty for when he received honor and glory from the Father, and the voice, voice was born to him by the majestic one, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And they saw Jesus alone. The disciples realized they had witnessed a preview of the Lord's second coming. And once they regained their composure, they must have had a strong and understandable desire to run down and report their astounding experience to the other disciples and to anyone else who would listen. That's natural. We'd want to go tell everybody in the world. We had just seen Jesus Christ as he really is in his glory. And you should have seen it. You should have been there. How extremely difficult it must have been to keep the vision to themselves. Just as Jesus had told the twelve that they should tell no one that he was the Christ, he now told the three to tell no one of his manifestation of glory. The Christ that most Jews of that day were expecting was not the Christ who had come. Instead of coming to conquer, he had come to die. Instead of coming in divine glory, he came in humble meekness. And instead of coming to deliver the Jews from political bondage, he came to deliver from sin's bondage all men who would trust in him. For the people to have learned then about the experience on the mount would, as already mentioned, have incited them to try, as they did on other occasions, to make Jesus into a king of their own kind to fulfill their immediate selfish and worldly expectations. But when they would hear the story after the Son of Man is raised from the dead, it would be clear that he had not come to conquer the Romans, but to conquer death. 
Whew, the tie with the forerunner. And the disciples ask him, then why do the scribes say that uh, first Elijah must come? And he answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. Now, did you catch that in those verses? There is a Elijah still yet to come. And there is an Elijah that already has come. Okay? The fifth and final confirmation of Jesus' deity is seen in his messianic relationship to John the Baptist. Having just seen Elijah on the mountain, a natural question for Jesus' disciples was, then why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? That particular teaching of the scribes was not based on rabbinical tradition, but was a scriptural teaching. It's in the Bible. It's there. Yes. Through Malachi, the Lord declared, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great an awesome day of the Lord comes. What is the great and awesome day of the Lord? What is that? His return. The great and awesome day of the Lord is his return in glory and his impending judgment of those that failed to, to accept him. Let's see. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and strike the land with the decree of utter destruction. Now Elijah is going to come. And he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers. To their children and the hearts of the children to their father. Okay. Now we see this in Revelations. There are going to be two witnesses. One of them, most assuredly, will either be Elijah that has never died and come back to earth, or an Elijah-like prophet. And they're going to prophesy for three and a half years. And they're going to do what? They're going to have power over the earth. They're going to have power over the elements. They can call fire down. They can stop the rain. They can cause it to rain. But what are they going to be doing specifically to the nation of Israel. They're going to be telling them. They're going to be telling them. What they're going to be telling them. The kingdom of God. Is at hand. Repent. 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 And be saved. Jesus Christ will come back to his own people. And the Bible says. They will look upon. The one that they have pierced. And they will realize that they missed it. That he was indeed the Christ. The prediction that the actual Old Testament person of Elijah would be the forerunner of the Messiah in his judgment was well known to the Jews of Jesus' day. Therefore, as Peter, James, and John came down the mountainside with the Lord, they couldn't have helped wondering how the appearance of Elijah might. Uh, they had just witnessed fifth Malachi's prophecy. In other words, they might have said, if you are the Messiah, as you declared, and we have believed in effect, why did Elijah not be appear before you began your ministry? 
Good question. But they missed the answer. The answer was already there. It was doubtlessly that the same concern that many of the Jewish leaders used to justify rejecting Jesus as Messiahship, and it was probably Malachi's prophecy that caused some people to think that Jesus was Elijah rather than the Messiah. Despite his great miracles, they may have reason Jesus cannot be the Messiah because Elijah has not yet come. So he himself must be Elijah. That misunderstanding was made easier by the many embellishments of the scribes and their fellow rabbis had made to the prophecy of Malachi. Like many Bible interpreters throughout the ages, including many in our own day, they liked to fill in the blanks, as it were, where a Bible prediction was not as clear as and detailed as they would have liked. Consequently, they taught that Elijah would come again as a mighty miracle-working reformer who would bring order out of chaos and holiness out of unholiness. They maintained that when the Messiah arrived, the world, or at least Israel, would be morally and spiritually prepared for him, and he would execute swift judgment and establish the kingdom of Israel. Well, folks, that's still happen. That's going to happen. Those very things right there are going to happen. Like all teaching that is only partially based on Scripture, as theirs was, for that reason, all the more misleading. Jesus responded by first acknowledging the partial truth, saying, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. There is an Elijah who is yet to come, and when he arrives, he will restore all things, just as Malachi prophesied. But I tell you, Jesus went on to explain, that Elijah has already come, and they didn't recognize him, but they did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. Now, what did the angel tell Zacharias about John? The Elijah prophesied by Malachi was not to be a reincarnation of the ancient prophet. Rather, as the angel of the Lord told Zacharias regarding his son, John the Baptist, the prophesied forerunner would come in the spirit and power of Elijah. John the Baptist had that spirit and he had that power. I believe he was filled from the womb. Is that correct? with God's Spirit. John would not be the ancient prophet come back to earth, but would minister in much the same style and power as had Elijah, in a way as told the disciples at least once before, John is Elijah who has come. Why then, some wondered, did John himself disclaim being Elijah when the priests and Levites from Jerusalem asked him, Are you Elijah? Well, John was not the physical reincarnation of Elijah. He said, I am not. He denied being Elijah because though he knew of the prophecy of Luke 1, like Jesus, he realized the question was about a literal reincarnation of Elijah. And though John did not, how can you be reincarnated if you hadn't died? That's kind of a misnomer there. Anyway. And though John did not share Jesus' omnipotence, he doubtlessly also realized that the questioning of the priests and Levites originated from unbelief, not sincere faith. They were not interested in learning the truth, but finding a way to discredit John, as they would later seek ways to discredit the one whose way he came to prepare. The Jewish leaders' false motives and ungodliness became even more evident when they did not recognize John as a prophesied Elijah, but did to him whatever they pleased. They imprisoned him, beheaded him. Therefore, whatever John's answer to, to the Jerusalem priests and Levites might have been, they would ultimately have rejected him because they hated John, and their hearts were opposed to God and his truth. Those who reject God inevitably reject his messengers. The full wickedness of the Jewish leaders was manifested, however, 
when they rejected and persecuted the Son of Man himself, who would suffer at their hands. Because they rejected the restoration work of the Messiah's Elijah-like precursor, and then rejected the Messiah himself, the Messianic kingdom was postponed. In the last days, the Lord will send another like Elijah, and the Messiah himself will return. This is time to this time to establish his eternal kingdom in power, righteousness, and glory. I personally think, but that's just my opinion, that it actually is going to be Elijah. Because Elijah did not die. die. He was translated, and I don't know what that word means exactly, but um, maybe that's what happens to us when we go in the rapture is kind of a... Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. There are two. And there are going to be two witnesses. We got. Yeah. They're going, yeah and they will die. Three and a half years. They'll, they're going to prophesy three and a half years. And who are they? Yeah. Elijah's one. Who's the other? Enoch. Enoch is the other. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I think, but that's just my opinion. So, what now? Yeah. A lot of people think it maybe it's going to be Moses is one of them, but as Tom pointed out. Moses Moses has already died. The Bible doesn't say you have to die twice. The Bible says you just die one time. So I do believe that it will be Elijah and Enoch. And at the end of three and a half years, God will allow them to be killed. The Bible says their body will lay in the street and the whole world will see and watch. And the whole world will rejoice because those two men who persecuted them are now finally dead. 50 years ago, it couldn't even. Exactly right. You get that little old phone, you can watch right there. Everywhere. Everybody. There's, there's African tribes carrying around phones. Tribal people carrying around phones so the whole world will see and they're going to rejoice because those men were able to call fire down from heaven. They were able to stop the weather and they prophesied of the coming Messiah and for Israel to turn and repent. Well, the people that are going to go through the tribulation don't want to repent. The only way you're going to get through it is if you don't take the mark of the beast. Yeah. Yeah. If you're in the if you find yourself in the tribulation, well, if you do Man, you messed up because <laughs> you've been in church and you 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 know it's real. You've heard it. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. People, it, it goes back to the Garden of Eden. People want to do their own thing. They don't want God to, you know, they don't want God to tell them. Uh, uh, yeah. So I did it my way. Yep. Well, it's either God's way, and you get to be with Him and live in eternal glory and life, and you're gonna have a wonderful life. We're gonna have jobs to do. There's, there. Uh, Paul said there's, there, there's no way that you could even understand what God's plan for us. But as Christ comes back and he reigns for a thousand years, 
we're with him. And he's going to reign over all the people of the earth. And I, I can only suspect that we're a part of that. Maybe, maybe God puts some of us in charge of different things. And we're, we're there with Christ, working with Christ. And we don't have to die again. We're, we're eternal. We're, we're, we, we've got glorified bodies. And, and maybe we can go from here to there in the snap of a finger or walk through a wall. I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's just going to be awesome, Amen. whatever it is. And then maybe, maybe 10 billion years from now, God will decide, hey, maybe I'll create something else. And you guys come help me take care of this. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. This be forever and ever and ever. Okay, that's all I got, Pastor. Glorified body. Thank you. Amen. Yeah. Great. Glorified. Amen. I tell you what, I look forward to that day. I don't know about you. But I do. I'm tired of the way this old world is. I'm tired of the, the fighting, the backbiting, the, all these things that are happening. It's time. It is time. Uh, it says in the last days, be like the days of Noah. And as we look around, we're seeing these very things. Amen? And uh, as for me, hey, I, I want to see everybody go. But I'm afraid not everybody will be there. Yeah. Yeah. But the good news is, is we won't know that they didn't make it because there's no sorrow in heaven. Amen? Praise God for that. Oh, I love him. And, you know, I'm thankful that God didn't give up on people. He could have given up on this creation. You know, he got frustrated with it once before. And he sent a flood. And let me tell you what. I, in my own estimate, I don't know. Because I wasn't around back then to know how bad it was. But in my estimate, it looks like it's as, as bad or worse. And I, I'm concerned about this country. Because this country was founded on Christian beliefs. And we've gotten away from it. Yeah, and we, we've justified sin but for, for, for whatever reason. I mean, homosexuality, a man marrying a man, uh, abortion, killing innocent life. And we look at, at, at what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah and why God rained down fire upon it. Listen, America, if God's a just and, and righteous God, then and he has no partiality, then America's got something to answer for. I hate it. I really do. But it's coming. It's coming. And I look and I think, well, you know, with our southern border being wide open, and that they've said about the terrorists that they've caught, that they then those that they didn't. I pray it's right at hand. Yeah. It's right at hand. I seen uh, on TV today that people must be feeling the same thing, because they said these stores that sell ammunition are almost out. Yeah. People have been buying up ammunition. Yeah. And why are they buying it up? Because they're fearful of what's to come. Yeah. Amen. We see yeah. these things going on in Israel and overseas. Listen. It, right it could be right here at our, our back door. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. yeah.
Amen. Amen. And they won't. They won't. He said that uh, the prime minister of, of Israel said that he was relying on the scripture, that they are God's chosen people and that they will not be destroyed. And I believe it too. Children of light. Sure. Well, don't the Bible say that the brain falls on the just and the unjust? Think about that. Right. But the good news is, is the just have a place in heaven. So, so what have we got to fear but fear itself? Amen? Praise God. It's been good. Thank you, Doc. Appreciate you, brother. I'm looking forward to the next time. Amen. Uh, next Wednesday, uh, Brother Harvey will be giving the word. Amen. I look forward to these Wednesdays. We need to bring more people with us. You know what? God's called us to, 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 to reach out, not just for ourselves, but for them too. Amen. And bring somebody in. Let's, let's, we say, well, look at the empty seats. Well, you know what? Why are they empty? Maybe because we never told somebody. Maybe we didn't encourage them to come. Amen? Let's start encouraging. Get in these place, this house full. This is God's house. Amen? And time's getting short. So we need to get busy. The devil's busy. And I'll tell you what, he's got plenty of... Have you ever noticed so many demonic things? Uh, uh, Halloween coming up. And all that they're, they said there's more money spent on Halloween. Think about that. A holiday of the, of the devil gets more attention than Christmas. Yeah, and they want to take Christ out of Christmas. It's not Merry Christmas, it's Happy Holiday. Think about it. I'm telling you, the devil's subtle. But he don't give up either, like Christians do. I guarantee it. And the sad thing is, is the churches are celebrating it. Yeah. And they say, oh, it's for the kids. Well, the devil sure wants you to think that. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this night. And God, we thank you. Father, for opening your doors to us, that, God, that we might come in and, and learn more about you, Father. For you see, you, you said that my people perish for lack of knowledge. God, we're here to get, gain that knowledge, God. God, has let us open our hearts to you, Father. Father, we invite you in. God, just take charge over us, God. Not just here in this building, God, but out on the streets, but in the stores, Wherever we may go, God, in family meetings, God, God, let our light shine, God, that others might see the love and grace and mercy of God. And God, we'll give you praise. Thank you, Father, for such an obedient servant as, as Dr. Rankin. Bless him, God. Bless him for his obedience. Bless these workers, God. And God, we'll give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.